by this lesson. And uh, I don't know, y'all ready? Yeah, ready. 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 About us as people, okay? And in general, us as people, we, we are creatures of habits. I mean, look around, how many people uh, sat in the same seat that they sat last week? We are creatures of habit. I mean, you ever had someone just put something in your seat? No. Are you serious? Didn't you see my name on there? We prefer, we prefer predictability. Yes. We prefer comfort rather than change. Yes. I mean, I think of uh, uh, you were driving to work when there's construction all of a sudden on the route that you usually take. Oh. And you're like, oh, how am I going to figure this out? Google Maps won't reroute me automatically. I have to figure it out myself. Change can throw us off. You went yeah. right there. Yeah. Our banking app, you sign in and it says, sorry, it's under construction right now. Wow. We'll come back oh. later. Yeah. You can't even see how much you have in your bank account. <laughs> or how about your favorite restaurant shuts down? Oh. Oh. That's hard. That's hard. That's hard. That's hard. That's hard. Where am I going to go now? Our phone or internet bill goes up. Yeah. And you have to change your budget. How about gas? Oh. It goes from three dollars one day, five dollars the next day. Thank God we live in California, man. I mean that we are so poor as human beings at managing change that there's a whole industry that was made to help us change. It's called change management. We can't deal with change so much so that people said I can make some money off of this. Wow. Helping people That's go true. through change. I mean, we say things, hey, we've always done things that way. Mm. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Y'all already know. <laughs> but as disciples, the reason we became a disciple is because we understood we are broke. Yes. And we needed fixing. You with me right there? Yes. You know, uh, what comes with being a disciple, though, is change. Yeah, it's true. Change is consistent. Mm -hmm. It's supposed to be there as disciples. Yeah. Jesus puts it in these words. He goes, you must be born again. Yeah. In other words, you've got to change everything. Mm -hmm. Not just start one, you know, when I was younger, I used to play these video games. And you would die in the video game, and you have to start the whole level over. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yes. Oh, and you get up and you're like, I just spent how long going through that level? But Jesus says, don't just start over the level. you got to start over your whole life. you got to learn how to be a disciple as a son or daughter, as an employee, as a student. You have to learn how to be a disciple in every facet of your life. You know, um, God, he says, in order to become a disciple, you have to start completely over. In other words, everything. You know, there's a lyrics that we just sang. It says, I don't walk the walk. I don't talk the talk. I don't sing the way. I don't treat my friends like I used to, but I added something. You want to hear them? I don't scoff the way. I don't treat my bills. I don't talk to my wife. I don't neglect my kids. I don't look at women. I don't get the grades that I used to. Since I laid my burdens down. What burdens have you started picking up again that you laid down? What are some of the things that you started picking up that God is saying those should be dead in your life? You follow me right there? True spirituality, true discipleship has to do with change. Yeah. You with me right there? Yeah. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Come on, Dom. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Give me an amen when you get there. Amen. Came ready with a Bible study this morning. You study your Bible? Amen. 2 Corinthians 3. Come on. Amen. Verse 18. Come on, bro. It says, And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory. And being transformed into his likeness with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. See, the Bible calls us to go through ever increasing glory. But you know, when we're not spiritual, 
It's our sin that makes us live back in mourning rather than glory. You with me right there? Right? Where we constantly, we're in a state of mourning. Why? Because we're not letting the things die that are supposed to die. We allow pieces of it to die, but then we resuscitate it back to life. And then wonder why we're in mourning. You with me right there? You know, growing up, my mom had this car, a 1980 Toyota Camry. The car got stolen three times. It was from the insurance company. They told them that it's out of all cars, this was the most stolen car out of all of them. But somehow we would get the car back every single time. I mean, that car was paid for three times over because of the insurance company. The insurance company was going, okay, you guys are doing something here. You guys are doing a little something shady here. But they kept giving us the money, so my mom kept the car. And I remember in the winter, uh, the, the starter started going out, and I would have to go and hammer the starter while she turned the key until it turned over so she can get to work. But she never got rid of the car, even though it was giving us trouble and her trouble. Wow. What are some of the things that are giving you trouble but you won't let die? Mm. It's time to let those parts of you die so you can engage in the ever-increasing glory that God wants you to. Come on. You know, outside of God, change seems impossible. Yeah. I mean, I remember growing up and hearing people never change. You ever heard that before? Yeah. People, yeah, they may change a little bit, but from their core, they never actually change. I mean, people get convinced and go, oh, it's just a phase that they're going through. Or they ask, what's gotten into you all of a sudden? I mean, to the world, change is stuff that's only for fairy tales. And to the religious change, radical change is only left to evil organizations like ISIS. Yet the scriptures call us to change. Yeah. We need to change, and God expects us to radically change. Yeah. You with me right yeah. there? Yeah. So the title of the lesson this morning is Transforming Worship. Right. We're going to study out how worship transforms us in different ways. So we got five, but we'll see what we get through. Amen? Amen. Point number one, worship purifies. Yes. Worship purifies. Turn your Bibles to 1 John chapter 3. Come on. Come on down. Worship purifies. You with me? Yeah. Come yeah. on, bro. First John chapter 3, verse 2. Worship purifies. Transforming worship. Come on, bro. First John chapter 3, verse 2. It says, Dear friends, now we are children of God. And what we will be has not yet been uh, made known. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. And here it is right here. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. The Bible calls us to live pure lives. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Come on, down. That's good. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Verse 1. What's the motivation behind living a pure life? 2 Corinthians 7, verse 1. It says, Therefore, since we have these promises, dear friends, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. Mm -hmm. See, the scripture says that we perfect holiness. Why? Out of reverence, out of reverence for God. <coughs> But, you know, as I remain a disciple longer and longer, I, I come to realize that there's more than just reverence that comes with worshiping God. Yeah. I think as we mature in our faith, we start to see how the, the effects of sin actually change our lives. Yeah. Yeah. And we get sick of it. Yeah. We look at how sin has destroyed our life and we go, I just want to stay away from that. Yeah. We see how God has given us this incredible life, and we go, I want that over right. sin. Yeah. Yeah. And it turns into this deep conviction. Mm -hmm. You with yeah. me right there? Yeah. We start realizing how much God has to offer. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we fight to remain pure. Mm -hmm. We start to see how deceitful sin is. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you've ever been caught up in a sin and didn't even realize it? Yeah. Yeah. 
The Bible says you can become so numb to sin that you can't even see it anymore because it's so deceptive. I don't know about you, but when I take communion, sometimes I sit there and just reflect on how grateful I am that God has purified my life. I think back of the life that I used to live and the life that I live now, and I just sit there and sometimes get lost in how grateful I am that God has purified my life. You with me right there? But the world, they try to tell you that you don't need to change. I mean, there's songs that are hits on the radio. Check out this lyric right here. But there's hope that's waiting for you in the dark. Sounds spiritual. You should know you're beautiful just the way you are. Sounds encouraging. And you don't have to change a thing. The world could change its heart. Don't get me wrong, great song. But the lyrics are so deceptive. You don't have to change a thing? Come on now, I know myself enough. And I need to change everything. What's the real truth? We are in need to be purified because the word the world modifies us. You with me right there? See, if we're looking to gain wisdom from the world around us, it won't be long until our perspectives change. The world rejoices in sin. I mean, why do you think there's such a hit song called I Kissed a Girl and I Liked It? Sing by a girl. Or Shots by LMFAO. Those are hit songs. Because they celebrate in the things of sin. It's why misery loves company. I mean, you ever felt so down and someone comes over, uh, up to you and they just go through the same thing and just kind of sulk in your, your misery? <laughs> Together. But then never come out of it. You guys just sulk in it. You know, as disciples, we understand that misery doesn't need company. Yeah. It needs shepherding. Yeah. It needs someone spiritual to get in there and help restore the purity of heart yeah. that comes with misery. This is why association is such a big deal. Right. I mean, someone once told me, hey, show me who your closest friends are, and I'll show you who you are. <laughs> you know, when I was in the fitness industry, being in shape and eating healthy was actually pretty simple. Because I was around people that were like-minded. It was convicting every single day of my life. I'd come into the office, and everyone's in shape, and I'm like, I want to be just like that. But then you get out of it. And all of a sudden, it's, it's hard to stay in shape. You know, the same way when we fight to be around godly men and women, we fight to worship which purifies us. We desire to do the same thing and remain purified like those around us, because worship purifies. Point number two, worship clarifies. Let's go to Psalm 73. Worship clarifies. Psalm 73. Amen. Beautiful. Come on, God. You guys with me? Yeah. 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 Psalm 73, verse 1. Seven. 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 Worship purifies, but it also clarifies. Yeah. Psalm 73, verse 1. It says, Surely God is good to Israel, mm -hmm. to those who are pure in heart. Amen. Mm -hmm. But as for me, uh oh, my feet had almost slipped. Oh. I had nearly lost my foothold. For I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They are free from common human burdens. They are not plagued by human ills. Jump down to verse 13. Surely in vain I have kept my heart pure and have washed my hands in innocence. All day long I have been afflicted and every morning brings new punishments. If I had spoken out like that, I would have been betrayed your, I, I would have betrayed your children. When I tried to understand all this, it troubled me deeply. Till I entered the sanctuary of God. Wow. Then I understood their final destiny. Yeah. This psalmist, he gives us insight into spiritual struggles. Yeah. It says, my feet had almost slipped. You know, uh, winter's like right here. Yeah. And there's going to be ice on the ground very soon. But you ever take a walk when it was snowing and think, this is going to be a beautiful thing, and the next thing you know, you're like, oh! oh, oh. <laughs> and you take it, oh! oh no. And your feet have almost slipped. Yeah, yeah. 
Asaph started to do the same thing. He's walking around mm -hmm. and distracted by all the things around him. Mm -hmm. Looking at the beauty of what the world has to offer him. Mm -hmm. And next thing you know, bam, he slips. You with me right there? Yeah. Yeah. And he's filled with regret how he's lived his life for God. Why? Because he's envying the world. Yeah. You know, I remember when I was single, I would see tons of my friends on Facebook getting married. They got quiet over here. <laughs> Maybe y'all are seeing that right now. You're seeing them. Yeah. Amen. But then, then, then a couple years later, they start having kids. And then I realized that I graduated high school before they did. And they're getting married before I do? They're having kids before I do? And next thing you know, doubt creeps in. We start to think the people in the world are the ones who have it all made. They don't struggle. They spend their money on whatever they want. They're fit. Man, look at me. That's what Asaph was seeing. And he gets into this fog. You ever been in a fog spiritually? Mm -hmm. yep. Where you just can't see, and no matter what light you turn on, it gets worse. Mm -hmm. You with me right there? Yeah. Some of us are in a fog right now because we've gotten our eyes off of the sanctuary wow. of God. Mm -hmm. Some of us are in need of desperate clarification. So how did Asaph get clarity? It says he entered the sanctuary of God. Mm -hmm. In other words, he went to the Word of God. Yeah. Yes. He worshipped at church with all of his heart. Mm -hmm. He heard the testimonies of faithful disciples. Yeah. And he fellowshiped with strong disciples to help get him out of this fog. Yeah. See, I think some of us, we've gotten sentimental about discipleship mm -hmm. because we only enter the sanctuary of God on Sundays. Mm -hmm. on. Notice it says only then he was able to truly understand their, their final destination. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was only when he spent time in God's sanctuary wow. that he understood the difference between us and the world. Yeah. Yeah. Until we get serious about our daily worship with God, yeah. we won't be able to lead anyone to Christ, wow. and we won't be able to lead others back to Christ. That's yeah. right. Yeah. See, Amen. worship clarifies, but independence objectifies. Yeah. Point number three, worship fortifies. Let's go to Ephesians 3. Come on. Down there. Ephesians chapter down. 3. Up, bro. You with me? Yeah, yeah, bro. Bro. Yeah, bro. Ephesians 3, verse 6. 16. Sorry. Ephesians 3, 16. Worship fortifies. It says, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may, power, uh, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. <laughs> you know, sometimes life can feel like a minefield. Yeah. Where you're trying to walk, where you watch every single step you're taking, and next thing you know, the next step, boom, it blows up. Wow. You ever been there before? Mm -hmm. But those are the times we need fortification. Mm -hmm. When we step on that mine of life, mm -hmm. man, it can feel, it can feel rough. Mm -hmm. But listen to the words of the scripture. Strengthened with power in your inner being. Mm -hmm. See, the reason God, one of the reasons God gives us the Holy Spirit is to strengthen us yeah. through him. I mean, you ever been trying to rely on your own strength rather than the Holy Spirit's? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I mean, something I pray for every single day of my life is discernment, clarity, and sensitivity to what the Holy Spirit wants me to do. Mm -hmm. yeah. What I've started praying recently is a sensitivity to hear the Holy Spirit of what He doesn't want me to do. Yeah. So I'm not wasting my time yeah. not being in step with the Holy Spirit. Yeah. You with me right there? Yeah. Yeah. Because I know my strength is no match against Satan's strength. Yeah. God has put some serious firepower in us with the Holy Spirit. Are you tapping into that power? You know, I think of some of the people that tapped into 
the Holy Spirit through worship. David worshipped and he defeated Goliath. Right. Stephen worshipped and saw Jesus and was stoned to death. Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego worshipped and they went confidently into the, the furnace and to the lion's den. Right. And Jesus, when he was tempted by Satan, he says, worship the Lord and serve him only. Mm -hmm. Because worship fortifies. Yes. Go to Ephesians chapter 2. Point four, worship unifies. Mm -hmm. On, this one right here hit me, okay? Come on, Man, I was writing this lesson, and on, this is the one right here. Yeah. Ephesians 2, verse 13. You guys with me still? Yeah. 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 Ephesians 2, 13. Mm. It says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two one and has destroyed the barrier." The dividing wall of hostility by abolishing in the flesh the law with its commandments and regulations his purpose was to create himself one new man out of the two he came to bring unity Amen. thus making peace and in this one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he he put to death their hostility why did Jesus go on the cross to make sure there was unity for us all. Mm -hmm. Man can only dream of this kind of unity, yeah. yet God says he can deliver it. Mm -hmm. How is it fulfilled? Well, disciples flip things upside down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, the weakest Christian is given the greatest care. Mm -hmm. The greatest leader is really the greatest servant. You with me right there? Yeah, yeah. Which brings unity to the group. Yeah. See, at the foot of the cross, we're all on the same playing field. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's no higher mountain that one of us can stand on above each other. There's no ditch we can hide in. Mm -hmm. It's all level ground at the foot of the cross. Mm -hmm. Go to 2 Corinthians 5. Oh, Come on, bro. Come on. 2 Corinthians 5. Come on, God. Verse 11. It says, Since then, we know that what it is to fear the Lord. We try to persuade others. What we are in plain, uh, what is plain to God, and, and I hope it is also plain to your conscience. Mm -hmm. See, unity is a spiritual byproduct of sharing in the common campaign of saving souls. Come on, bro. In fact, it is those who have been who've given up the common campaign of Christ that causes disunity. Right. You know, yesterday I was thinking of one of the things that caused disunity. There's many things, amen. But I was thinking in Galatians 5, there's, there's this term there, selfish ambition. And usually I think of selfish ambition as maybe stealing or lying or cheating. And it's just something in those levels, and that's pretty much it. So I looked up the definition. It simply means to put ourselves forward out of selfishness. Yeah. And I started thinking past the obvious stuff. And I started to think of convenience. Wow. I mean, we live in a world of convenience. We'd rather go to get fast food than to learn how to cook. We'd rather go turn in a car that, that we could have easily maintained than rather than just maintain it. You with me right there? Convenience, some of us can give into convenience rather than righteousness. I mean, how many times have I hurt myself because I gave into convenience rather than righteousness? You know, something more recent was uh, um, was me gaining weight. And uh, what convicted me, probably got me scared the most, was when Lindsay said, don't you want to be in your son's wedding one day? Oh. And I was so convicted by this. How selfishly ambitious was I being because of what I was putting in my mouth? Oh, wow. With me right there? Yeah. I think of when I when I, I have chosen in the past not to get back to someone. And just how deep this thing can be in me. Yeah. Yeah. When I leave someone on red, it's so selfishly ambitious. Yeah. Or or when I when I choose not to call someone back because I know they're gonna ask me a question I don't want to answer. Mm -hmm. You ever done that before? Yeah. It's putting myself forward out of selfishness. Right. But it causes disunity. Yeah. 
I think of simple questions someone asked me before. Where are you at? Mm -hmm. oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> or what happened? Sometimes I don't want to answer because out of selfish ambition. Yes. Mm -hmm. When someone asks intrusive questions, how do you respond? That's right. Mm -hmm. That's are you fighting to keep the unity that comes with the Holy Spirit? Right. 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 No. Or are you fighting against that unity? Right. You with me right there? Yeah. You know, something the Bible says is we're already unified. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're fighting to keep the unity, right. mm -hmm. not fighting to restore it. You with me right yeah. there? Yeah. So rather than being honest, I want to protect my ego rather than answer and leave them on red. Mm -hmm. Or I don't return phone calls because I know they're going to ask me questions that I don't want to answer. Mm -hmm. But family, I'm sharing this to show you how deeply rooted selfish ambition can be. Yeah. 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 How it is a unity destroyer rather than a unity builder. Yeah. Yeah. But see, as disciples, when we're focused on the campaign for lost souls, it pushes us to keep the unity. Yeah, right. I know for me, sometimes I'm sitting there like, I don't want to get in the way of the harvest. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be the reason why God held back someone, yeah. potentially, because I'm being so selfish with myself. You with me right there? Yeah. When we're all on the campaign of Christ, we can realize that it's unity that builds up the kingdom. Yeah. It's unity that, that shows God we are trustworthy enough yeah. to be added to. Worship unifies. <laughs> Final point here, you can cut that. Easy as he's through. Am I talking to anyone this morning? Yeah. Yeah. We got four minutes. Yeah. Yeah. We got four minutes. Yeah. I'm not going to be selfishly ambitious. Amen. Yeah. 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 Four minutes. Easy as he's three, verse 11. Worship satisfies. Easy as he's three, 11. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity on the hearts of men, yet they cannot fathom what God has done from beginning to end. Solomon has bars, amen. Here the scripture says we're spiritual beings. Whether you think it or you believe it or not, you're a spiritual being. Why? Because I know for me, I've asked how many times, why am I here? What am I supposed to be doing? Yeah. What happens after death? Yeah. The Bible says God intentionally put that on your heart so you can consider Him one day. Mm -hmm. yeah. And He made it so obvious that even in your mind, God is there. Right. It says that God has set eternity on our hearts. In other words, God has put a deep yearning for us to, to ask those deeper questions. Yeah, right. David says it so beautifully in Psalm 63. You can turn it, we'll close out here. Come on, bro, come on. Psalm 63, verse 1, one of my favorite scriptures about having quality quiet times. Mm -hmm. Psalm 63, verse 1, it says, When he was in the desert, uh, oh, sorry, when he was in the desert, Judah. Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you, my soul thirsts for you. My body longs for you. In a dry and weary land where there is no water. I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory. Because your love is better than life. My lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live. And in your name, I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with the riches of foods. With singing lips, my mouth will praise you on my bed. I remember you. I think of you through the watches of the night. Because you are my help, I sing in the shadows of your wings. My soul clings to you. Your right hand uplifts me. Worship satisfies. In conclusion, what does it take to truly change or be transformed? Well... We have to worship. And when we worship, it purifies us. When we worship, it gives us clarity. When we worship, it fortifies us. When we worship, our church is unified. And when we worship, our souls are deeply satisfied. Let's worship like we've never done before. I love you guys. You got to be able to.